Uh, good afternoon or evening almost at this point. Uh, I'm really excited to be on this panel. This is the first time I'm chairing a panel. Usually I just speak on them, so this is going to be a new, uh, hopefully fun challenge for me. Um, again, the title of the panel uh, is Failures of Care, and so we're thinking about this question that the Astro Gates posed around who feels responsible for sort of looking after um, the legacies of black people um, and thinking about great black people within our histories in the Americas and worldwide, who feels responsible for that? And so to sort of jump off, I'm going to have a couple of opening comments. I'm going to open it up uh, to Burgess, uh, then Simone, and then to Doreen finally uh, to talk about a lot of their work and how it relates to this question. Um, but I'm going to start with a little story from my childhood, because uh, I think stories from childhood are always great places to start. Um, so I grew up in Northern California uh, in a small town called East Palo Alto. Uh, we are adjacent to Stanford University, but we do not share in the wealth of Stanford uh, University in any way. Um, but what was really interesting about my town is that my school district, particularly my school, figured out some type of way to budget for a publishing center. And so basically this was a room, a trailer actually, with an older woman who would sit there literally all day and you would bring her stories and she would type them out. Um, and so before I left second grade, I had written, published, and illustrated over a dozen books. Um, and it was very exciting to me. Very exciting moment for me. Thank you. Um, because at that point, I was reading books made by other people, but there was something fascinating for me to walk into a place, pick paper, pick binding, and then to have these books. Um, and as you can see up here, there's an example of the about uh, the author page, because we would have these author readings where our family and our friends would come. You could listen to the uh, young authors talk about their writing. Um, and then when I left second grade, the books were deaccessioned. Um, I took them home and I put them in my personal library. And at that point, uh, our personal library was basically this uh, oak uh, bookshelf that my uncle had built while he was incarcerated, but I had repurposed it. It was a bad bookshelf, but it did what it was supposed to do. Um, and I would check out books to my younger brothers using these library cards that I made out of packing tape and cardstock. And so even though obviously I was not waxing poetic about like the politics of knowledge production at, you know, in second grade, I was very astutely aware there was something significant about me making books. And there was something significant about me sharing that information with other people. And there was something significant about the fact that no one visited our town except if they were giving charity or there was a police incident. Um, but people were coming to hear a bunch of like second graders talk about books they had published. Um, and so when I left second grade, um, I continued to write a lot. And unfortunately, when I was 12, our family became homeless and we lost a lot of our stuff, like ephemera uh, books. I lost a lot of those books, unfortunately. Um, these are the two survivors. Um, and I lost a lot of photographs. And so the, one of the ways I ended up coping with that was by collecting a lot of stuff. Um, and so again, there was this archival impulse for me around this idea of radical visibility. I was collecting stuff because I was very fearful that people would forget that I existed. I wanted to leave some trace behind. And so um, as I think about a lot of my practice, this is me with books, almost every single picture before the age of 12 is with me in books. Um, I talk about my dad a lot because I think that he, uh, really invested in us, all five of us, there have four brothers, uh, this importance around reading and this importance around writing, um, but particularly being authors of things that we produce, right? Um, and so for me, the archive presents an opportunity around radical visibility, and I feel like a lot of the work that I've been doing has been around leaving a trace. Um, and then I made this list of like the productive possibilities of the archive, and a couple of notes here. Um, around a possibility for asserting a multiplicitous existence of blackness. Um, and to borrow Edward Said's language, this idea around human density. Uh, to also think about uh, ways that we sort of live beyond the containers or theories that uh, are organized around black people to think about issues of legibility and fungibility. Uh, to think about this idea of unfolding. Uh, to think about this idea of resisting abbreviation in discursive form, but also in materials form and lifespan. So what, what does it do to, what does it mean to use the archive to resist abbreviation? So there's a whole list of other things um, that I think about with regard to the archive. Um, and then about nine months ago, I started to think, I started to think that I was wrong. Um, and I started to think, uh, what are the limitations of radical visibility? Uh, what are the problems with being seen? What are the problems with having traces of your existence available to lots of people? And so I sort of uh, divided my concerns into three categories. Around, one around audience um, and making archives of black people. Uh, whose audience? Are we making these archives for the purpose of showing white people that we are valuable, uh, that we have depth, that we have excess of, of beauty? Or are we making these for other black people as a recognition or a reminder of our texture, right? Um, are we doing this as part of a neoliberal project around diversity, including black voices or marginalized voices for the purpose of being included to, to sort of represent this rainbow um, coalition of just people who are all holding hands and being together. 
Um, I was also thinking about issues of use, and, I, and Simone is going to obviously talk more about this because I'm not the surveillance expert, uh, but thinking about issues <laughs> around who's using uh, these archives. Uh, black people are not only the only people interested in archives of black people. There are obviously people who are interested um, in these archives uh, that don't always have educational uh, desires. And so thinking about who's using them and for what purpose, um, and the sort of safety issues around radical visibility and accessibility. Um, and then the final part is just sort of a question around the scope of collecting. Um, the Astor's Gaze question is around uh, how do you sort of collect histories of great black people? And I'm sort of curious about how do we collect histories of not great black people? How do we collect the histories of my mother who works at Home Depot? How do we collect the histories of my students who are in and out of prison and in and out of you know, foster homes? How do we collect those histories as well? Um, and so I'm going to stop talking now because this is not about me. This is about all these wonderful people who are here today. Um, and just sort of go on the note of just inviting everyone as we're speaking. If you have questions for one another, we're more than happy to go with those questions um, in the discussion section. Um, I think this is going to be great. So thank you. Okay, so my name is Burgess Jules. I'm an archivist, um, and I'll use my uh, five minutes uh, to give a brief introduction to the Documenting the Now Project, um, which is funded by the uh, Andrew Mellon Foundation, and we're super thankful uh, for that. Um, I'm the community lead for the project. Ed Summers is our technical lead and our lead software developer. He's here today, um, so I always got to give props to him because um, we've been sort of uh, working on this stuff for a while. And basically, you know, we're interested in uh, the role that ethics can play in archiving uh, social media and other web content uh, for the long term, right? And so I think that part, sort of long-term preservation, is uh, something that we need to think about as we're talking about sort of building these, these, these archives of data and, and what that means for people sort of seeing uh, their data um, in, these, in these spaces for 10, 20, 30 years from now, right? Uh, this project was inspired by uh, the Ferguson protests in 2014 after the killing of Michael Brown. Um, and our goals at that time were not only to find ways to capture that moment uh, as it was unfolding on social media, uh, but we also wanted to demonstrate that it, was, it, that it was important to be aware of the risks that people of color were taking in sort of protesting in public and sharing that information uh, in online spaces, right? Um, we saw the stories about um, police departments during the several major protests we've seen in the last uh, couple of years, sort of using social media data to prosecute people uh, later on. So we were uniquely aware of that, of that um, risk as we were thinking about how to, how to archive in that space. Um, yeah, essentially we were concerned with how to build data archiving tools that wouldn't uh, model oppressive systems uh, that could eventually be dangerous to already marginalized people, right? Uh, we wanted to uh, be able to protect people as much as we could while doing this work and the urgency to sort of protect people was apparent like really from the beginning, almost from the beginning as we started doing this work. Um, Ed Summers uh, and I started sort of talking about this work uh, in, in August 2014, and Ed started collecting uh, Ferguson tweets uh, right around, um, I think maybe the, the couple days after the protest started. Um, and I think at the end, we ended up with about 30 million tweets um, uh, from, from Ferguson, right? And all sort of different spikes that happened as the protest, I mean, lasted you know, over a year. Um, and Ed published a uh, blog post about that work um, on his blog, and one of the first, actually the very first people to reach out to us was this company, uh, Boston Fusion, which is a uh, social media sort of mining company. That, right, one of, that's one of the things they offer is sort of social media mining. I'm assuming they sell sort of that data to firms, to businesses, to police departments. Um, and so, you know, they emailed Ed asking for access uh, to that data set because we hadn't published huh. the data set online, right? Um, and that experience, you know, was really eye-opening for us um, as, we were, uh, as we were sort of interacting with these people and doing this work because it sort of really became evident 
um, uh, how dangerous this could be for people sort of represented uh, in that data. So that was a really eye-opening um, uh, moment for us. So this request for data uh, was especially eye-opening because uh, since we received it, we've seen Twitter shut down access to their firehose to several uh, different um, uh, data mining companies, right? And uh, these mining companies were sort of using social media data and selling it to police departments or selling the tools that they were building around social media data to police departments. And Twitter sees that as a surveillance activity and they strictly prohibit that. Um, uh, sort of, they don't like developers using their API to sort of do surveillance activity. So that's how they interpret it, what those companies were doing. So we've seen them shut down companies like Data Miner and uh, Geofedia, which was a famous, ex uh, really popular example. Um, and the ACLU, uh, thanks to them, they're doing a lot of great work for us right now. But the ACLU was the, co was the um, organization that really broke a lot of this because they got a lot of information from these companies um, and from, the, um, uh, uh, from Twitter themselves, showing how the companies were specifically marketing their tools to police departments because they said that they could use those tools to um, monitor protests, right? To monitor protest activity. In some cases, they mention Black Lives Matter. In some cases, they mention um, protesters themselves, right? And so this is something we were um, really uh, aware about. So uh, in addition to companies profiting off users' uh, uh, data for surveillance, we're now learning more about these national security letters right, that are coming out. Um, a famous example is the Internet Archive, which uh, was able to win a court case, and they were able to sort of reveal that they received one of these, um, an action which is generally illegal. Um, when the government sends one of these letters, they don't, like, they don't want anyone talking about them. So the Internet Archive was able to sort of uncover that. And we've seen some other companies um, be able to talk about these, uh, these national security letters. And we're now just starting to understand how the government is sort of really invasive and how they sort of go after our data and how they try to keep us from even knowing that they're going after our data. So even as um, Twitter has shut down some of these companies, you know, in some way, they're, they're also giving access in sort of these roundabout ways, right? So after Twitter uh, shut down uh, the data miner company, the FBI hired data miner to do some work, and Twitter gave the company access to their fire hose again, right? And people are like, well, you just shut them down. How, is it, how do you think now that the FBI is not really going to do surveillance, right? Because they've sort of described what they're going to do with their purpose in a different way. So we still need to be mindful of, um, uh, of how uh, these companies are using that data and what they're saying that they're going to do with it and how social media uh, companies really respond to, the, to those requests. So I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's fair to say we're living in uh, interesting orange times. Um, because, <laughs> you know, we have a president now uh, in Trump who has, you know, huge support from uh, the law enforcement community, right? We have a president who campaigned on saying that he was a law and order president, um, and we know what that means for people of color, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I thought, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, we have this vindictive sort of egomaniac uh, in office who cares what people say in tweets, right? And we already know what the government uh, sort of surveillance arm is doing uh, as far as tracking us. You know, I think that's just a recipe for, <laughs> for disaster. Um, and it's something that really brings great concern to us. Um, so as far as documenting the now uh, is concerned, you know, we understand that it's only so much that we can do to control um, sort of uh, what's happening, right? So people are gonna use data to do all kinds of things. Um, uh, but, you know, we don't have to be in that camp, right? People are gonna use data to, to, be, to hurt folks, right? To sort of prosecute people, um, to do all kinds of things. We don't have to be in that camp. We like to think about what we're doing uh, as a version of designing for social good. This is actually the uh, title of a post on our, um, on our blog by uh, our designer, uh, Alexandra Dolan-Meskel. 
Um, and you know, part of that is designing archiving tools that can give the public some control in uh, how their data is collected, right? So whether that's giving folks the option to opt out of being collected, uh, giving folks the option to remove their data from previously collected uh, data sets, or finding ways to involve the public uh, in sort of designing these archiving tools, right? Um, no matter how small you know, the impact of these things, we believe that there's an important, you know, there's some importance, right, in modeling non-oppressive data collection uh, and preservation, and DocNow is really committed to that. Um, we hope to release the first version uh, of DocNow within the next six months, hopefully, Ed. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're really excited to see how uh, folks will interact with it because it's really been an open process uh, as we've been developing the tool, and that includes um, talking with activists and having activists from Ferguson uh, involved in the design process and sort of giving us feedback uh, about how to build a tool for archiving social media. So I'll leave it there and move on. question um, for this panel was, as Camila told us, um, who feels responsible for the failure of care around um, black people? So I'm going to start off with one moment of a failure um, that we, <laughs> of that type of care um, that came about uh, this week. So February 1st, um, the president, 45, had a, uh, what he called a little breakfast, um, emphasis on the little, for um, Black History Month. Oh. <laughs> um, and in it, and during that time, uh, he said that uh, Frederick Douglass is someone who's done a terrific job, bigly amazing things, some, you know, things that he's often been saying. So very dismissive of uh, Frederick Douglass, pointing to a failure to care about the legacies of, of great black people. But out of this, uh, and then the um, press secretary, Sean Spicer, later re-up and said, you know, uh, Frederick Douglass is going to be doing really great things. It's, it, by the end of the day, it <laughs> seemed that they weren't quite aware if he was dead or alive or what the great things is that he was, you know, had done and was going to do. And so out of that came, uh, also on that day, you had a tweet from the vice president that um, to uh, celebrate uh, Black History Month, and in doing so, he pointed to, uh, he centered a white person within that, that being the former president, um, Lincoln. And so out of that came a hashtag called uh, Pence Tweets, or Pence um, uh, Black History, where people then kind of um, took that moment of care of those legacies through uh, through a kind of trolling of uh, Vice President Pence. And so I use this to, as an entry point into um, discussing some of my work. I work on surveillance with a particular focus on what happens when we enter or we enter into um, discussions of how black people are surveilled. What does it do to our very discussions of surveillance? And I particularly like to look at how um, the legacy of transatlantic slavery and its contemporary afterlife uh, could allow us to ask maybe different questions about how people resist surveillance and also challenge it in our, in our contemporary moment. And so I have here what uh, uh, moments of a failure of care here by um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Jessica M. Johnson at John Hopkins University when she uh, created this tweet uh, of Frederick Douglass. And so one of the things that she does in her work is she has an archive called um, African Diaspora PhD, which functions as almost like a, a repository, but also a blog site, a, an online journal of um, work within the African um, diaspora. So that's one moment in which um, a digital social memory and online care get together um, on this site. And I just have on the end of this slide um, a Siemens Protection Certificate. And so when I ask how can the past allow us to ask questions about our present, one of the things that Frederick Douglass did in his escape to freedom is that he used this either borrowed or forged Freeman certificate to pass into Freeman as a free sail freedom as a free sailor. So I just 
So a lot of what I do in my work is um, uh, look to artists. I think artists do a lot of the heavy lifting and theorizing uh, when it comes to thinking about and questioning surveillance, whether that be um, a Hank, Willis Thompson, Hank Willis Thomas or Adrian Piper or some of my favorites, uh, Mendy and Keith Obadiki, who are a rhizome, uh, uh, I guess, stars, I can put it. Um, and, and this artist here is um, Robin Rhodes. So it's quite diasporic in terms of the work that I look at here. Um, this one is a, a piece called Pan's Opticon. And in it, I use this as a jumping point, jumping off point to think about the role of looking back of what might have been called at one, t one point reckless eyeballing, but what Bell Hooks calls an oppositional gaze, one that challenges surveillance. And the interesting thing about this, not only um, in the title of Pan's Opticon, the idea of a play on the Pan Opticon, that um, you know, model of a kind of uh, prison that becomes a metaphor for contemporary life, where the idea that the guard is in the center and there's control happening, but the, the prisoners, and by extension, those in society can't necessarily look back at that guard. In this one, he's looking back. It's this kind of ocular interrogation of power, of surveillance of walls, and of privacy. And so I think that you know, art really does some important work in, um, when it comes to um, freedom and creative and expressive practices. And it, it's really been helpful in my um, own theorizing. So one of the spaces that I look at, I like to look at, well, I don't like to look at, but I've been looking at biometric technologies, the idea of whether it's facial recognition or fingerprinting or other, other things, but one part that's been um, important in my research and a site that, that is ever, ever more important um, is the airport and particularly the passenger um, processing zone. This is the space where we get rid of our liquids um, and other um, things that we carry with, but I've, these, these are sites where what, what, is, what has been called the so-called war on terror gets played onto the, um, the, the, I guess, the home field here. And it's often a site where black women are subject to scrutiny. Many of the women who I've interviewed, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, you can see on Twitter with these um, people that tweet to the TSA, have had, um, whether it is um, quite invasive hair searches or what they call the non-invasive pat down um, with the back of the hand. You'll often see signage in um, airports that say, things like TSA cares and why don't you text them to tell them what great of a job um, they've been doing. But other people have been using their Twitter handle to talk about um, anti-black racism and the kind of circumscribing or thinking of black hair as dangerous, as uh, terroristic uh, uh, in these spaces. And so, um, you know, airports are spaces that have become, that are, that are very contested, especially we saw that last weekend. So air travel, as you know, is a very privileged form of travel, but for other people, it's also the airport becomes a site of the ban, a site of deportations, a site of containment, or, or even detentions. But as we saw this last weekend, it was also a site of resistance, of activism, and people uh, really critically engaging the law as a way to challenge um, the ban. And so I just, um, I'll just uh, leave this here to think about, we'll get into our questions about care when it comes to um, uh, black people and visibility, and maybe I'll just close with um, you know, one other artist that, I, that also challenged um, the airport space as a, as a site of surveillance with us, Solange. So thank you. <laughs> My name is Dorian St. Felix, and I'm a writer at MTV News in addition to other places. I am nominally a music critic, but because I am often focusing on the musical production of black artists, I have to think about questions like safety, privacy, and um, when we were all given the question by Theast Theaster Gates to meditate on, which is about the failure to care, it made me think about the black artists who say, in front of the question, how do we, uh, how do we make the archive less oppressive, the black artists who respond that they don't care. I don't care, I don't care about the archive. And so I'm here to talk about the ephemerality of black cultural production and also resistance to the archive and to the process of archiving. Um, so about a year and a half ago, I reported this article for The Fader, which is a music magazine, which tends to focus on specifically young black musicians and young black artists. Um, and I interviewed 
uh, people who were using the platform Vine, which we all know. Vine, in October of 2016, announced that they would no longer be operating and essentially has become an archive. If creators have decided to download their videos, they're able to exist on platforms like Instagram and Twitter, but people are no longer able to make videos on this platform. And my, my, the question that I wanted to ask these people were, how did they feel about the either lack of recognition that they were receiving for their cultural production, or how did they feel about perhaps the, uh, how did they feel about being overly recognized? Um, and the first person that I talked to was somebody named Peaches Monroe. Does anybody in this room know who Peaches Monroe is? She is a teenager from the Midwest who basically invented the phrase on fleek, which we know since, <laughs> since its birth has lived many lives, has essentially become officialized language. And I asked her if she had made any money off of all of the branding and all the things that have happened after th this fine that she made, and she said that she'd made nothing, which is very surprising to me. Um, and I just want to quote from the article so there's this essay, which was written in 2008 by K.J. Green, called Lady Sings the Blues, Intellectual Property at the Intersection of Race and Gender. And in this essay, Professor Green situates the American conundrum of race and proprietorship, which means owning, at the specific moment of blues music production. So this is at you know, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. Blues, as opposed to other musical forms, leans on an unpredictable meld of instrumental prowess and rapid improvisation, and not on a premeditated capitalist conscious calculus. And Professor Green says, black artists had no input in, co in copyright law when it was being uh, made. And examination reveals that it is in some respects incompatible with black cultural production in music. So she's arguing that multiple copyright standards were specifically structured to, pe to preclude black blues artists, and of course, we know that means that's going to primarily affect women, from claiming ownership. And then she says, the idea expression dichotomy of copyright law prohibits copyright protection for raw ideas. She contends that this standard provides less protection to innovative black composers whose work was imitated so widely that it became the idea itself, as opposed to an instance of a song, an instance of an album. So when we talk about the archive from a literary or philosophical or etym etymological perspective, what we are talking about is a graveyard. I'd also like to cite Professor Saidia Hartman, who I hope everybody in this room has read. There's this essay that she's written called Venus in Two Acts, and it is about essentially impossible speech. What do we mean by impossible speech? We mean speech that occurred in history but was never able to have been recorded. Um, and the Atlantic Ocean at the bottom of it holds so many bodies that we're never able to speak. And Professor Hartman, excuse me, just one second. Professor Hartman asks this question, how can narrative embody life in words and at the same time respect what we cannot know? How does one listen for the groans and cries, the undecipherable songs, the crackle of fire in the cane fields, the laments for the dead, and the shouts of, vic of victory, and then assign words to all of it. Is it possible to construct a story from the locus of impossible speech, or resurrect lives from the ruins? Can beauty provide an antidote to dishonor, and love a way to exhume buried cries and reanimate the dead? So I think it's important for us to all mind this question, which is a very difficult question, about the relationship between blackness and the act of archiving, blackness and the act of writing down. There is death in writing things down, and blackness has always had a very tenuous relationship to speech, both within the colonized context, but also without it. Um, I'd like to talk about the figure of the griot. The griot is a figure which comes from West Africa, which has been romanticized in the centuries since their actual practice, but the griot was often seen as ghoulish within cultures because the activity of the griot 
was to hold all of the stories, was to be something of a praise singer. The griot, in that way, held stories that certain people might not have wanted to be public, held stories that would have made more sense in the context of privacy. And so I think that it's important to, when we consider the c cultural production of musicians in particular, to understand that there might be intended illegibility in certain songs that they make. Um, which is to say, not every artist wants every single person to understand their production. Not every artist makes universal music. And so in the act of archiving, if the archiving is in an official speech like English, if the archiving is happening in an American context, what about the artists who don't want to be placed within that? Um, and that makes me think a lot about the act of remixing, the acts of rhythms. Rhythms um, come from Jamaica, and essentially it's a, it's a general beat or a general rhythm that then becomes the foundation for a bunch of songs that are made after, after it. And in the, in the American context, rappers would call that remixing. That's something that is indigenous to the way black artists think of ownership. It's both, it's fungible, but it is also something that speaks in a context besides speech. And so how does how do archivists who are interested in speaking the initial language of the instance of art, how do they do that when the methods of archiving that we have are based on speech and sometimes based on languages that these artists don't even speak in the first place? And then I would also like to just bring up an instance of this rapper, his name was Sean Chung. He was living in the Bronx. In 2014, he was arrested and then he was uh, released on parole. In 2016, he was arrested again um, because there were lyrics on his Facebook site that talked about the DA who had put him in jail a couple of years before. And so I think there's a lot of dialogue to be made between the way musicians feel about um, the way criminality can be read into lyrics and how there are many police departments across the country are figuring out that they can use timelines on Twitter, they can use timelines on Facebook, to essentially remove the artistic context of music and place it into a criminalized context. And so that's a question that I think a lot of music uh, producers, but also a lot of music critics are scared of. It's a question that we are preparing to deal with, um, I think, in, in, the, in the coming years. And so I really wanna talk about music in this context. I really want to advocate for the artists who might not want to have their things written down within context that they didn't intend to. Thank you. So I have a lot of questions. Um, however, before I get into that, I just wanted to check in to see if you guys had questions for one another before I jump in to a couple of things. I can go already. Um, so what was really interesting about what I heard from everyone is that everyone started at this point of uh, the archive being a necessity, um, a thing that we take as a, a, a given that we all use and is necessary and sort of went off into different spaces to think about like what are the potentialities of it and sort of what are the dangers of it. And so I was hoping that folks to speak a little bit more about uh, what can be captured in the archive and what can't be captured and just sort of like the productive possibilities of things that can't be captured. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically about uh, a lecture that I listened to from Simone and a lot of what Doreen was speaking about around uh, the potentials of not being measured or captured. And so I would be interested in us thinking about the archive uh, and the things that sort of move against the archive. What are the potentials of not being measured or captured or documented? So your question made me think, I'll, I'll go first for a little, just for a little bit here, about um, consent. And when I first sent um, the images of those tweets where people were um, complaining to the TSA about their hair searches, I didn't have their names uh, redacted. And so what does it mean to have consent in those spaces, in public spaces for people using a, a, a platform that's um, publicly available? So that's um, one thing. But there, I think, I guess with the lecture that you were talking about, I, I was discussing the idea that perhaps being unvisible or illegible might be a moment of freedom or a temporary uh, escape or reprieve from surveillance. So the idea that some bodies might not be read by cameras or by certain uh, other technologies and there was perhaps something um, liberatory to be then. 
But um, in asking that question, how does the past allow us to ask questions about the present, I found in my research that I couldn't really um, find out some things about the past. And that's why I, I think the, um, the quote that you gave from uh, Sadia Hartman about this critical fabulation, that this kind of speculative way that we could imagine the impossible, and in our very imaginings, just show how impossible it is to do that imagining through, um, whether it is for me, through art or through um, fictional texts or other types of um, creative acts. And so in doing that with an ethical of ethics of caring, I think is important when, when we're discussing um, the lives and, uh, and of black people. Um, so, you know, I think what's interesting is when we started this work, um, you know, very early on, I mean, we were, as archivists, you know, we're sort of seeing a whole bunch of sort of data sort of fly across the screen. And our first instinct, you know, as, as sort of professionals is to try to collect this stuff. Um, and we got some pushback um, early on from people, uh, mostly black people, um, who were like, hey, you know, are you getting permission to collect this stuff, right? And um, that question has sort of stuck with us for a while. Some of those people are here today, Jared Drake, my good friend, uh, people like Meredith Clark. Um, you know, they, they challenged us to think about, you know, what it might mean for people to be in an archive where they did not consent uh, uh, to be in, right? And what that means um, when you look at the history of sort of surveillance of black people. Um, if you look at the Panthers, if you look at sort of, you know, uh, COINTELPRO, things like that, right? There's a history of surveillance of people of color um, as they're participating in civil disobedience. And what does that mean uh, in the digital space where, you know, the volume of data is just immense and not something we can really uh, sort of think about in any sort of um, uh, a way that makes sense right now. Uh, but we know it's important to try to collect that, right? But, it, you know, a lot of folks have this idea in the archive that, you know, it's out there, it's public, we should collect it. Um, and they don't think about how to protect people and how to ask for permission. Um, but in the physical sort of space, right, as we deal with physical archives, you know, we've come up with a lot of protections uh, for folks, right? So we have this thing called a deed of gift as we, um, as archivists, and that's a legal contract between a donor saying, hey, I want to give you my photographs, I want to give you my letters, um, you know, the university or the archive that you're working with, if they're sort of doing it in, in, a, in, in a professional type of way, they'll have a deed of gift, which is a contract that usually a lawyer has seen and has signed off on that says, okay, you're giving me your stuff. Here's how we're gonna take care of it. Um, I have an option as the donor to put clauses into that deed of gift to say, well, you know, I want parts of it to be closed for 20 years or 70 years if I'm a politician. Um, and I want parts of it to be digitized or not to be digitized, right? And so we've built up some protections in the physical space that I think um, we could easily sort of transfer into, um, into the digital space. But I think, you know, partly, you know, some of the issues we, we come up with are volume, right? How do we, you know, make sense of sort of 30 million tweets on Ferguson and how do we sort of get permission um, from people within that data set to sort of have their tweets in our collection? Um, I think there are ways around that. A lot of it can happen sort of at the beginning of a process. So can you build a tool that sort of communicates with people that they're being collected as they're taking part in a protest and using a hashtag, right? Can they see a message that says, hey, your data is being collected for this particular project, click here to opt out, right? Can we sort of think about ways that, that we can sort of uh, allow people to have more control? Um, so those are some of the things we're thinking about. I do think it's possible because we have come up with some of these protections in the physical sort of world as we deal with archives, right? Um, I think I'll just speak very briefly about the tension between the formal nature of archiving and the informal nature of certain moments of cultural production. So speaking about Vine, which was something that became a cultural phenomenon that I think was very heavily associated with very young black people, a lot of those kids essentially had no interest in being a part of an and mm -hmm. being a part of the archive because the phenomenon was happening as they were cre were creating it. And so now we're two years on and now we see the importance of having somebody like Peaches Monroe or people like Jay Ferzacci. I don't know if you guys are familiar with his videos, but they're very ingenious. Um, 
Now, I think the question of care came up a little bit too late, essentially, mm -hmm. because at this point, platforms like Twitter and Instagram have essentially colonized this aspect of creating these like very quick, very referential uh, ephemeral videos that these, these kids had essentially built. And so I think this was a question that came up actually in the second panel. How do we keep up with the pace of ingenuity? How do we keep up with the informality of it? If the archive speaks a language that these children or younger people don't speak, is it even relevant? And I think that's something that is an intraracial question. That's not necessarily, um, I think when we talk about surveillance, we must also talk about class, we must also talk about age, um, and all of those things kind of interrupt the way language might naturally occur. And um, I, especially as a journalist who's one or two generations removed from the artists that I study, I'm often trying to think about how can I have as little of an asymptotic relationship between their natural ways of expressing themselves. And so that if an article is read 20 years from now, that article could be a representation of that language. Thank you. Um, and as you guys were speaking, another thing that I was thinking about, um, was, I guess is sort of a question of not the archive as the place where we hold a lot of these things and what. Because I, uh, I think there's something very interesting about saying that there's some things that can't be captured in the archive in the form that it is now. And so I, I, maybe I'm curious about whether it's okay for things to not exist for future generations. Is it okay for me to get to 60 or 70 and not to have um, a record of something that someone said or something did? And, and is there any detriment uh, involved in not having those things if we haven't figured out a way to do them um, in the ways that we feel are the most caring and the most loving ways to do it? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think it's okay to not have uh, certain things in archives. Um, you know, I think this idea of um, the right to be forgotten uh, is, is a good one, sort of on, a, on an individual level, right? Um, I think, you know, people like elected officials, right, who have sort of have a responsibility to the general public, I think, you know, we need to think about how, um, you know, we document their activities. But individuals, you know, taking part um, uh, in, these, in these spaces, I think, have a right to not uh, be in data sets 20 or 30 years from now. I mean, the problem is, you know, we're using platforms that are inherently public um, and are sort of, you know, just out there and open and available, right? And people are going to use it for all kinds of nefarious reasons. Um, and the people doing, thinking about sort of um, protecting folks in these data sets are a very small number, right? And if you, you know, you know, I look at the makeup of this room right now, and I see, you know, we have four black people up here talking about uh, the care of, of uh, folks and data sets, and, you know, we're in a room that's majority white. Um, that's very common, right? But we, it seems like we're always the ones, sort of the, the, the folks being affected are always the ones talking about um, why it's important to, to do this kind of work. You know, last year, um, I'm proud to say I was part of a historic moment where we were in a room talking about web archives with probably the most diverse group of people ever assembled to talk about web archives, and there were only about 40 of us. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, the space of sort of archiving the web and archiving data is very white. Um, it's generally a space that doesn't think about how um, sort of being represented uh, in these archives can be dangerous, and so they don't build tools that take that into account. So yeah, I do think because of that, uh, some things don't need to be um, um, archived and some people don't need to be archived and that's okay. Um, and we spoke a little bit about this, I guess, right before the panel about the makeup of the archival community um, and just sort of the distribution um, of types of people who are in this field. But I guess I'm also really curious about people other than professional archivists who do this type of work and what role they play in this uh, production of narratives and histories around black folks, but also, um, I guess, what respect they're given, because there are several people I can think about in my community where I grew up mm -hmm. and in my community now who I would consider to be the main archivists. They're the people mm -hmm. who are keeping stuff. They were the people who are remembering things 
even if they weren't written down, but they don't end up in the same rooms like this and they don't end up in right. conversations. And so I'm curious if we can sort of think about uh, what other people within our communities who are doing this type of important work uh, that need a bit of, uh, rec not even recognition, but just acknowledgement of the work that's being done. Um, yeah, I'm curious about who those other people are that you know of um, that we can speak a little bit about. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to hog the mic, <laughs> but, but all right. But that's where the archivist. <laughs> so right. yeah, yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, a lot of my work is around uh, community archiving, mm -hmm. right, and thinking about um, how communities can document themselves, right? So that's why we're really uh, excited to have um, four activists from Ferguson join us last year at, at this Doc Now meeting. Um, where they were sort of giving us an insight into how uh, social media uh, played into how they were taking part in protests and how they think it should be archived and what they want people to remember about them and, and of the movement. And it was really important to hear their perspective about you know, what they think we should collect and how we should collect it and, and the fact that, you know, you know, frankly, a lot of stuff happened that was not on social media, right? And so we need to think about sort of the value of that as, as documentation uh, of the movement, right? Um, so yeah, I, I really believe in sort of, as you know, we're in this sort of the professional side of this, um, empowering communities to, to document themselves. And one way we could do that as professionals is to build tools that are usable uh, to a large amount of people. It sounds very simple, you know, but I think sort of this idea of mass documentation is gonna be really important as we move forward. Um, in the next few months, in the next four years or eight years, um, having tools that are easily usable, that are easily deployed, that people don't have to have sort of these deep technical skills to be able to use to archive in this space is gonna be one of the most important things that I think we could do as archivists, one of the most important contributions we can do as professional archivists and, and software developers in this space moving forward because the, the problem right now is, you know, one internet archive is not enough. You know, internet archive is doing amazing work um, but we have an opportunity to build tools that thousands of people could just use to, deploy, uh, to, to, to document their communities, document their own local spaces, right? What do, what do local hashtags look like in a community of 40,000 people? What are those people talking about? Um, and so, you know, I, I'm really interested in this idea of usability as a way to, um, usability of, 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 of um, sort of data archiving tools uh, as a way to sort of, um, diversify sort of the historical record, right? Um, that's, that's an idea I'm really interested in. I think that's gonna be really important moving forward. Great, I wanna open it up to uh, the audience because we have about, I think 15 to 20 minutes left. So if you have questions uh, for this amazing panel, please do. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> My question is um, just uh, first, I mean, I want to acknowledge the fact that there are so many archives hidden and secret in the hands of governments and uh, corporations that are beyond anything that's, um, I mean, they, they had to hold on before. My question is, do you think we are reaching to the point in history that these, these type of archives are having a huge impact, major impact on human destiny? I mean, considering the fact that, uh, for example, for Brexit or um, and the presidential election here, um, a company like Cambridge um, Analytica was hired and they have so much info and they, they could focus and target every single in, individual online based on the information they have. I mean, just something that sometimes brings this to, um, makes me realize how, uh, how much information is out there about myself is when I wanna f fill out a form with my previous addresses, I usually don't remember them and go online to search for my own, my own previous addresses. So there's so much info out there, I just wanna see, do you think there is a, a imp huge impact that's changing our destiny? I guess I should go yeah, for it. Yeah, surveillance expert uh, sure. took that one. So I guess um, with that, um, I forgot the name of the company that does that kind of um, e emotional surveillance or Cambridge psychometric, Analytics. Cambridge Analytics, which is owned by like Blackwater or something like that, was able to, so there's those things happening online every time we like or we um, heart or we do a kind of emotion 
um, on Facebook. And, and as we've seen in that, um, it, it, it did have quite an effect in terms of like um, ads and news and what kind of things we would get to um, our feed. Um, however, um, I guess I could, wanted to maybe switch the question around to think about these large scale, the, what you talked at the beginning about these sites of data that, we, that, that certain companies or certain organizations have that we don't necessarily have access to. And, um, and maybe can get to something else that we were talking about earlier. So on, in August of last year, I was had one of my many tabs open on my um, laptop. And it was one of them was on Instagram. And it was the moment where I saw what, would I, what would I, I would come to know as the, um, the killing of Corin Gaines. And she was live streaming um, a, a, a kind of face off uh, with the police um, in her home uh, outside of Baltimore. And, um, and right before my eyes, I would see parts of these videos being removed. And what had happened at that moment is that the police had used a portal um, with Facebook um, and, and via Instagram to remove what she was actually witnessing this violence um, at the time. And during this time that this was happening, people were also noting that they were being removed and they were downloading or using some type of like technology to, to have access to this video. And so that was in August. And then in November, uh, another video, I guess I'm assuming that came from those moments when people, whether it was an ethics of caring or witnessing, or sometimes when um, killing of black people becomes, or their suffering is um, uh, an, uh, inaudible or uh, unheard for many, um, there was a video that came out and uh, Corin Gaines said, I am not a criminal uh, in that moment. And I think that is, that event raises the question of who has access to these sites and what kind of sites do we use to kind of claim um, our, our humanity to witness uh, the kind of killability of black people um, when it could be said that like a, a, fa a, fa a police department could call Facebook and have those things taken down. So I think those are like, you know, emotional things as well. That reminds me of this past summer, it was actually in July, a woman by the name of Diamond Reynolds was live streaming on Facebook, mm -hmm. Facebook Live. Um, her, her boyfriend, uh, whose name was Philando Castile, had been shot by a police officer during a traffic check and he was bleeding, his arm was almost completely falling off of his body and for about 15 minutes, Diamond Reynolds with her four-year-old daughter in the back of the car is essentially narrating what's happened. And so what she's doing is she's trying to stay alive, but were we to analyze this in terms of the actual content of the video, she's creating an archive on top of an archive. Because the video itself, if it was just 15 minutes of Diamond Reynolds trying to keep her husband alive, would not necessarily communicate what her narration did, which was, I am recording this video so that they don't say that Philando was dangerous. I'm recording this video so that they don't say that I was dangerous. And so I think the possibilities of narration, the possibilities of self-reporting within platforms like Facebook, which actually have censoring abilities has become enormous in the past couple of years with the new prevalence of photos and videos, live streamed videos of black people being harassed or sometimes even killed by the police. And so I think when we think of black people, black women as narrators, there is this question of the impossibility of speech, right? And when there is a ready-made audience that is able to then testify to that immediacy of that archive, I think it um, sort of circumvents the question of, well, what is Facebook going to do with this video now that it's been made? Because thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people have seen it, and they're, now they're able to also become witnesses to this one witness. Um, yeah, I think that that's really interesting, and it reminded me of... Um, Sorry, I'm, yeah, okay. But um, uh, Christina Sharp's book, In the Wake, and when she talks about black annotation, like the way that you were phrasing that made me think of that. And I wonder if anyone could speak to that sort of layering of narrative or of an archive and its connection to the idea of annotating and that being this like potential way to, rather than narrating what doesn't need to be narrated or what you know should say secret, sort of that act of annotation. And how, I think on the internet also maybe there's like a space for that. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts. It's not really a question. I don't know. Sorry. Do you have thoughts? 
Not quite yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothesis, I think, is a site for annotating on the internet. It's probably not exactly um, what Sharp uh, means there, but there's those moments of having like two separate readings of a text, and I think people are doing that with, um, I guess, the 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 at uh, the White House website, or I have my students annotate books that way. And, Hi, um, so I guess this question will be towards the whole panel, but um, Doreen, you mentioned um, Venus in Two Acts by Stia Hartman, and when I read the, um, that piece, um, what, what stuck out to me was how she emphasized that the violence of the two young girls being remembered um, in a sexualized way, the sexuality that was imposed on them. And then also the violence of the fact that this is archived, that it is written down, and that she is, and that she is recalling it. And you know the conversations that that you've had, that you've had on the panel, um, it's kind of just like reshaping what um, I thought um, the what I thought was definite about an archive, the fact that you know an archive should exist because it bears witness and it places. A, um, blackness in history where it has been erased. But, um, you know, you definitely complicated that because sometimes it's not necessary. Sometimes that it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be tangible. And Cam Camila, you um, posed the question um, about does the ar archive change, um, you know, according to the audience? And so I guess it's, it's some, um, I guess it's more of a general question, but um, how do you think the archive changes depending on the, the audience? Um, if it is, you know, the audience um, to educate people to the people in this room or versus, um, you know, a, a community of, a local community where everyone, where everyone is black, so. Yeah. That's a clarifying question. So when you say how does the archive change, like the content or its reception or both or its distribution? Sorry, now I asked you a bunch of questions. <laughs> the, the, con the content and the distribution. I think one thing that I have been thinking a lot about is, um, I'm sure many people, or hopefully many people have thought about this, around decentering whiteness um, and not making things that are, that are designed for the purpose of talking about blackness, about constantly being a response to whiteness and being for the purpose of educating white people or for the purpose of um, showing that we have humanity. And so I think when I think about archives and the way that I would love for them to be uh, used, love for them to be distributed as sort of like a reaffirmation for other black people. So for me, um, obviously white folks can look at archives of black people, but I, in my own practice, I'm working on an archive right now of, um, of uh, fringe religious groups in the black community. So religious groups that don't sort of occupy um, the collection scope of a lot of places and going in and, and spending lots of time with them and talking to them. And so in that process, I'm not really interested in saying I'm doing this for the purpose of educating white people about this religious group that started in the early 20th century in some like mountain. I'm doing it because I think that there's some importance in um, sort of making visible, at least in this, in this instance, sort of the texture of religious experience so that other people can sort of look at this and say, yeah, I see that, I recognize that maybe there's something that, I could, that can be reflected in my own um, subjectivity in, in that process of looking at that. And so I think um, there has been a lot of archival work that's been organized around neoliberal politics of, of diversity and inclusion, which is I'm making this because I want people to see how interesting black people are, and I'm not interested in that type of work. I think that that type of work um, further erases black people because it displaces blackness for the purpose of making, uh, creating a comfortable environment for other people. And so I think that there is something that can be uncomfortable about looking at archives of particular black histories that needs to be uncomfortable because I think that discomfort is generative and I think that discomfort is also a reminder around legibility. Uh, and I want to I wanna talk about legibility for like forever because I think it's an important thing to really think about because I think uh, and visiting some archives, there are elements um, that will be legible to some audiences that won't be legible to others. And I think there's often a push to sort of shift finding aids and shift other accompanying materials to sort of help people 
of understa understanding to access things, and I'm constantly thinking about how accessible black bodies are already, and these additional attempts on top of um, our existing attempts to make bodies more legible and histories more legible and accessible, um, and sort of being okay with like, maybe you'll visit an archive and there are 10 boxes and you'll understand three of them. Um, and that being okay, because I don't think that legibility should be the purpose of the archive. I think their presence is important. I think that if you don't um, understand every single detail, there's still value in viewing it, even if those details and those nuances and those contours, uh, contours aren't immediately accessible and legible to you. That, uh, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, I actually have a question, um, well, more, kind of like more, more of a comment to like what you just said in terms of um, how blackness is oftentimes compared to white, like almost immediately compared to whiteness and this like homogenous um, re reading of history and how like white, <laughs> essentially white history, um, is very homogenous in its development and it's very like, like hetero heteronormative, the, the way that it's read linearly in this like heteronormative way. Um, blackness is oftentimes uh, contextualized or kind of conf confined to existing in this vacuum or this like heteronormative um, linearity. So it's like, oh, well, if the black people started off as slaves and they're free now, we're good. Um, but really, um, it's, a, it's like gumbo. There's like eight million things in the pot and when you dip in, you'll get like five of the 25 ingredients. But I think with like, with uh, this, the, the I guess this idea or the purpose of the archive is to kind of like uh, rectify and like acknowledge its messiness and just kind of like be able to, you know, uh, document what's there and then, you know, dust your hands off and like walk away without having it um, need to be so formulaic or so um, self explanatory. So I think like it's kind of naive to think about um, the history, like black, like black history. Um, as being something, or like the like audience, it's like I think an audience is important insofar as intention and you know like products being made, but it's hard to magnify or really pay attention to like re or really uh, I guess critique if um, once it's made, it's like it, be, it takes on a life of its own. So I think that like it's it, it's just the archive. It's it for the sake of existing. It, it, it's important to just exist, but if you need it to exist at like at, to uh, create a byproduct or to create a product, it's naive and it's never gonna really accomplish that. So, yeah. Can I respond? Yeah. Yeah, um, I like everything that you said because it reminds me, there's a poet, um, her name is Susan Howe, and she talks a lot about this idea of the stutter. So these like these disobedient parts or these messy parts of history um, that sort of refuse convenient narrative arcs. Um, and some people obviously being uncomfortable with the fact that they can't read something and then plot a very clear uh, linear passage to this other thing that occurred, um, but also recognizing that that discomfort is a really interesting place to sort of stop um, and be okay with. Like, things don't develop in a linear fashion. I think that there's a lot of language around uh, pre-periods and post-periods and, and all, all these prefixes we add on to these different uh, sort of points in history that sort of convey uh, that there is a clean immaculate cut from one uh, point in time to another that I think does a disservice uh, to the way that we understand history, but I think it does a disservice, uh, I think it's an intentional disservice to understanding the continuities between different periods of time. And I always come back to the example of Obama and his election because obviously people are like, it's a black dude, he's a president, we're in post-racial America, and that was a big thing, and you could, I literally got in arguments with people about this who are like, when we look back on this moment, you'll write, and I'm like, when I look back on this moment, I'll feel the same way. Um, <laughs> but I think, it's, I think there's, a, there's a desire to get to this point where things are clean, um, or things are not messy, um, and I think it's a, an interesting desire impulse, but I think it is, I think it rests in a, a severe discomfort with discomfort and a severe uh, refusal uh, to do the work to even get to a place where people can, can, can have these conversations. Right? Everyone wants to get to the good part of the story where everyone's happy and holding hands, but then no one wants to do the work, and so I think if we think about the historical context in which archives, as we traditionally understand them as institutions that hold stuff, if we think about the context in which they developed during colonial times for the purpose of collecting information about colonized bodies for the purpose of controlling them, I'm collecting this so I can see you, and by seeing more of you, I can control you more effectively, and thinking about this at the same time as the development of encyclopedias and other 
uh, sources that are supposed to contain a definite, finite amount of knowledge and history, that it makes sense that people go to the archive with a desire to get a finite, uh, clear, concise, non-messy. But it's not a realistic thing to think about history progressing in that way. It is not. I don't think realistic to think about history as a progression. There are all these hiccups and these hauntings that occur where we're in one moment and we feel haunted by the thing that just happened before, and we feel disoriented, like because we we aren't comfortable with that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say about this sort of post, post-racial post moment since Obama and thinking about um, how uh, his, his Twitter archive, right, is being saved. And, you know, my interest is in the replies to Obama's tweets, right, and to mm-hmm. tweets about Obama, right, and capturing, you know, sort of all the racist uh, messages in there because that, to me, will tell us more about uh, sort of the time when Obama was president and sort of what people really thought about it. But at the moment, we don't have a great way to sort of archive uh, replies mm-hmm. to tweets, right? And so it, it's uh, something we're working on. But, um, you know, I think uh, context of, of, of a message uh, is, is, especially on something like Twitter, is goes so much deeper than that tweet that you see there, right? And what will that mean uh, in 20 years from now when we don't see how people re- replied to sort of Obama's tweet about, you know, the Affordable Care Act, right? Uh, how many people are responding in racist ways there. So I think that we have a lot to learn, though, a lot still to do. Um, do we have time for one more, or do we have to wrap? Is it a quick one? Is it more of a comment or more of a question? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, first, thank you. This is very interesting. Um, so I have a very specific question. So what happened to the whole thing where Twitter is going to give the tweets to the Library of Congress? Because that could solve the long-term <laughs> preservation, right? Replies and others. Um, the, you should ask the Library of Congress. Um, I, I don't know what's going on with that. I don't think only the people, you know, uh, we know that they've given tweets and the Library of Congress continues uh, to collect those tweets and they still have them. Um, but access is obviously not on the table right now. Um, and so that's a question for the Library of Congress. I would also <laughs> say, though, that that act, the enumeration and accumulation of tweets, does not, it's never going to be able to translate the community of people that exist on Twitter, right? So if you look at just one tweet, and maybe it's about somebody live tweeting scandal, that is not going to be able to express that there were. 50 or maybe 100 right. people tweeting about that thing at the same time, and they were actually all in dialogue, all in conversation, which reminds me, I wanted to talk very quickly about American exceptionalism. I think <laughs> that... <laughs> Ideally, I'm not an archivist, but I feel very hopeful that the multiplicity, the multiplicity of archivists in different regions will sort of combat the idea that blackness even began with slavery, uh-huh. that blackness even is constricted to this continent, that blackness speaks English all of the time. Um, and so I think that uh, as an American black person who is a first generation immigrant, my family's from Haiti, it's very important to me that I'm able to understand that there are archives of blackness that exist outside of this country that I will never be able to understand. And when we talk about decentering whiteness, I think it's also important that we decenter Americanness and decenter the idea that we can always understand things or that we can always read things and that sometimes it's better to not be able to read something because your legibility is oppressive. Thank you. That's a great note to end on.